Este es un informe especial de Noticias Univisión. Y le agradezco que todos estén con nosotros. Anoche el FDA anunció nuevas políticas para aumentar más las pruebas de manera sustancial. Ahora tenemos pruebas para ser usadas en los diferentes estados, aparte del FDA. Los estados están muy involucrados, han estado involucrados desde el principio, pero estamos trabajando juntos lo más posible y las pruebas van bien. Y dentro de poco tiempo, todos los laboratorios particulares van a comenzar a hacerlo. Nunca antes había hecho esto. Y va a ser algo muy... Uh, creo que va a ser increíble si se hace debidamente. Estas son maravillosas compañías. Son entre las mejores compañías del mundo en sí. Así que los estados van a estar... Eh, con ellos y con los gobiernos locales, eh, comisionados locales y todos también tratan con nosotros. Tenemos una capacidad de pruebas tremendas. Hoy día también estamos anunciando una expansión drástica de nuestros servicios de Medicare, Telehealth, servicios de salud a través de videoconferencias o por teléfono y los pacientes lo pueden hacer sin costo adicional alguno, incluyendo con servicios como Skype y FaceTime. Es algo histórico que nunca se ha hecho antes tampoco poco. Además, los estados tienen la autoridad de darle cobertura a los servicios de telehealth para los pacientes médicos. Haciendo esto, el paciente no está viendo al médico per se, pero está viendo al médico en sí. Así que no hay que acercarse. Durante este momento no vamos a aplicar nosotros las penas de HIPAA para que los médicos puedan desarrollar la atención a sus pacientes utilizando uh, telehealth. Por lo tanto, no vamos a multarlo si no si quebrantan HIPAA. Vamos a utilizar este telehealth para limitar exposición al virus. Ha sido un método de comunicación muy exitoso. Nunca se había usado en una escala como la cual vamos a usar nosotros este telesalud. También ustedes van a poder mantener mejor la capacidad de los hospitales haciendo esto. Anteriormente, esta mañana hablé con ejecutivos de las industrias de comida rápida de Estados Unidos, Wendy's, McDonald's, todas las grandes, Burger King, y fueron maravillosos hablando sobre... Eh, debido a las pautas de ayer que ustedes escucharon para evitar beber y comer en barras, restaurantes o en sitios públicos. Hablamos de la importancia de estos servicios de entregas o servicios de busca su comida desde su propio auto. Esto va a ocurrir en estas próximas semanas. Ya está ocurriendo. Han sido fantásticos, ellos, absolutamente fantásticos. Ya lo están haciendo, pero lo están manteniendo abierto. Y pequeños, menor personal, gente muy capacitada, empresas muy capacitadas y están haciendo estas recogidas. Ayer le instamos a los estadounidenses que tomen acción por 15 días para tratar de eh, terminar con este brote, un periodo de 15 días. Ahora podemos decir que son 14 días, 15 días desde ayer. Y le pedimos a todos que trabajen, si es posible, desde su casa, pospongan cualquier viaje innecesario y limiten reuniones sociales a no más de 10 personas. Sacrificándose de esta manera y haciendo cambios temporales podemos proteger la salud de nuestro pueblo y podemos proteger nuestra economía. Yo creo que nuestra economía volverá muy rápidamente a recuperarse. 15 días de ayer, veremos a ver qué ocurre después de eso. Si hacemos esto correctamente, nuestro país y el mundo, sinceramente, pero nuestro país puede de nuevo comenzar a funcionar muy rápidamente, muy rápidamente. Tenemos que luchar contra ese enemigo invisible supongo desconocido, pero lo estamos conociendo mucho más ahora. Hoy día el Senado está tomando proyectos de ley de coronavirus, del coronavirus que tiene que ver con pruebas gratis para aquellos que las necesitan, también licencia pagada para aquellos trabajadores impactados por el virus. También estamos comprometidos para dar el apoyo a los pequeños negocios que necesitan. Una de las cosas que hablamos nosotros con las operaciones de comida rápida, hablamos con el, los directores ejecutivos y presidentes de todas las compañías. Una de las cosas que hablamos es ayudar y darle apoyo a los pequeños negocios, dar la flexibilidad que necesitan ellos y para sus trabajadores y estamos trabajando para solucionar eso ahora mismo. Bajo mi instrucción, el ministro Menuchen se va a reunir hoy día con los senadores sobre otros paquetes de uh, estímulos adicionales. Hasta noche, tarde en la noche, estuvieron reunidos y durante gran parte del día ayer están ocurriendo cosas tremendas. Un gran espíritu, un espíritu tremendo. Puedo decir esto para los republicanos y los demócratas. Puedo decir que esto con respecto al gobernador Como tuvimos una gran conversación esta mañana, todos estamos haciendo las cosas muy bien y estamos coordinándolo. 
Y estamos de acuerdo, diferentes estados necesitan diferentes cosas. Y estamos de acuerdo en eso, 100%, pero tuvimos una muy buena conversación y creo que estamos en el mismo camino los dos. Va a ser muy exitoso. Nueva York tiene un problema bastante grande, supongo que es el sitio, el epicentro más grande, sin culpa de nadie. Así es como es. Pero estamos trabajando mancomunadamente, muy cerca también. FEMA está muy involucrado, ha estado involucrado y ya lo estamos llevando a otro nivel diferente. Y todo estará listo. Estamos tratando con el Cuerpo de Ingenieros del Ejército, si eso fuese necesario. Están trabajando hoy en algunos casos y están en espera en otros casos. Pero mi conversación con Andrew Cuomo fue una muy, muy productiva y una muy buena. Le agradezco esto. Estamos dando el alivio a las industrias afectadas y pequeños negocios. Estamos cerciorando lo que nosotros emergemos de este desafío con una economía próspera, creciente. Porque eso es lo que va a ocurrir. Va a resaltar tarde de repente. Un día vamos a estar parados aquí y vamos a decir, bueno, ganamos. Y lo vamos a decir, tan seguro como estamos acá ahora, vamos a decir esto. Y vamos a ganar. Yo creo que vamos a ganar con la mayor rapidez posible que lo que piensen las personas. Espero. Más tarde vamos a reunir hoy día con los líderes de la industria del turismo, también como detallistas y mayoristas para hablar sobre sus roles críticas. Me reuní con la gente de las tiendas de departamento, todos los detallistas, los grandes, incluyendo a Walmart y otros. Fue una gran reunión. Están almacenando sus tiendas con existencia como nunca antes, tratando que la gente compre menos, si es posible, que compre menos. No se lleve todo. Compre solamente lo que necesita por un rato. Van a mantenerse abiertas y hasta todas horas del día. Pero han sido fabulosos ellos. Estamos tomando acción firme como a modo de nación y a modo de una sola familia para que los Estados Unidos puedan permanecer fuertes, sinceramente más fuertes que nunca antes. Y nos damos cuenta que a pesar de que muchos trabajadores estadounidenses, muchos pueden trabajar en sus casas, muchos otros no. Muchos de nuestros profesionales de la salud, socorristas y hombres y mujeres del servicio de alimentación y fábricas están demostrando, están presentándose en el trabajo diciendo, estoy presente para darnos servicios y uh, mercancía que necesitamos. Queremos que se queden en la casa, pero cuando hablamos de servicios alimentarios, fábricas, eh, especialmente ciertos artículos, ellos eh, están diciendo presente y están ejerciendo todas las reglas de seguridad y regulaciones de que mencionamos. Ahora, sin más nada que decir, quisiera presentar al vicepresidente Mike Pence, que me dice unas pocas palabras, y entonces yo presentaré a otras personas. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señor presidente. Buenas mañanas, buenos días. Se debe saber claramente el pueblo estadounidense que el presidente Trump ha iniciado no solamente una nueva manera de abordar el gobierno, pero también manera de abordar todos los Estados Unidos. La interacción del presidente hoy día y a través del curso de todo esto con líderes de la industria en todo el país arroja que no solamente estamos nosotros usando todo el peso del gobierno federal, pero también de la economía estadounidense. Yo sé que yo abro el nombre del presidente cuando digo qué inspirados estamos nosotros de la manera en la que el pueblo estadounidense ha dicho presente y los negocios estadounidenses grandes y pequeños han dicho presente. Ha sido inspirador. Eh, mi fuerza eh, extraordinaria se reunió esta mañana y nos centramos en las pruebas, eh, que es la prioridad del presidente eh, estadounidense, el eh, abastecimiento de eh, materiales y alimentos. Hay pruebas disponibles en todos los 50 estados, como indicó el presidente, a través de la acción rápida del FDA, instada por los gobernadores en todo el país. Ahora, eh, las autoridades de salubridad estatales pueden autorizar a los laboratorios en los estados para desarrollar la capacidad de llevar a cabo pruebas. También con relación a la acción del FDA, de la cual pronto vamos a escuchar más, y ahora continuamos desarrollando la sociedad que el presidente forjó con los laboratorios comerciales en todo el país, aumentando acceso a el alto volumen la alta producción de pruebas de coronavirus que se está desarrollando grandemente con más acceso aún en estos momentos que hablamos acá. También nuestra fuerza extraordinaria, nuestro grupo extraordinario habló del de progreso del servicio de salubridad estadounidense y FEMA que está trabajando juntos con los gobiernos estatales con socios en el sector particular, privado, como Walmart, CBS y otros para desarrollar sitios remotos para llevar a cabo pruebas en todo el país y más tarde hablaremos más de esto cuando estas comiencen a surgir. Es importante que el pueblo de se entiende que las pruebas están ocurriendo en todo el país, que todos nuestros sitios de salubridad quieren que yo le diga al pueblo estadounidense, usted no necesita resultados de pruebas para saber qué es lo que usted debe de hacer. El presidente Trump 
las guías y pautas a seguir de 15 días de, sobre coronavirus del presidente Trump son, las, son lo que deben hacer todos los estadounidenses eh, en todas las comunidades. Son las mejores pautas del CDC y del presidente. Como dijo el presidente, instamos a todos los estadounidenses que por estos próximos 15 días practiquen y cumplan, se acaten con los principios de las pautas del presidente sobre coronavirus. Al ejercer y cumplir con estos principios, todos los estadounidenses creemos que podemos disminuir el brote de coronavirus. De hecho, nuestros peritos nos han dicho, nuestro grupo extraordinario, que si todo estadounidense actúa sobre las pautas del de presidente sobre coronavirus, podemos ver una reducción sustancial en el brote de coronavirus. Como dijo el presidente, ha de tomar que todos lo hagamos. Si usted se siente enfermo, que desde su casa, si alguien en su casa tiene un resultado positivo de la prueba, mantenga toda la casa en la casa. Especialmente si usted es una persona con un padecimiento subyacente de salud, quédese en su casa y practique ese distanciamiento social de las personas. No se reúnan más de 10 personas, como dijo el presidente, con líderes en la industria, todos los estadounidenses, especialmente tiene que practicar buena higiene y sentido común. El pueblo estadounidense en general, el riesgo de una enfermedad seria es bajo, pero le pedimos a todos los estadounidenses que se asocien con nosotros a este esfuerzo para disminuir el brote del virus, especialmente para que tengan presente los de la tercera generación u otros que tienen padecimientos de salud subyacentes, a quienes puede ser muy drástico y muy real la amenaza de coronavirus. Como dijo el presidente, ha continuado empujando nuestra fuerza extraordinaria, nuestro grupo extraordinario para estar inspirado por todos los estadounidenses. Nos inspiran los negocios, cómo responden los gobernadores. Ayer hablamos con los líderes de todas las uh, cadenas de televisión que pronto van a tener una campaña de servicio público usando las pautas del CDC, específicamente al trabajar nosotros sobre el asunto de abastecimientos. Ayer nos reunimos con el Departamento de Defensa sobre de exceso en uh, provisiones. El presidente y yo nos vamos a reunir hoy día para hablar sobre la cadena de eh, materiales para los hospitales y le pedimos algo específicamente. Le pedimos a las compañías de construcción que donen su inventario, su inventario de máscaras N95 en sus hospitales locales uh, y no pidan más máscaras industriales debido a lo que el presidente pidió se incluyera en la legislación que pasa por el Congreso día estas máscaras industriales que utilizan en sitios de construcción son perfectamente aceptables para los trabajadores de salubridad para que estén protegidos de la enfermedad respiratoria. Pero le pedimos a las compañías y empresas de construcción que el presidente conoce muy bien debido a sus antecedentes, le pedimos que donen sus máscaras N95 en sus hospitales locales y también que no hagan órdenes adicionales. Bajo la instrucción del presidente, nosotros vamos a continuar haciendo todo lo posible, todo lo que esté necesario. Vamos a continuar a, a, ayudando al pueblo estadounidense, pidiéndole que se unan a nosotros las personas que están detrás de mí. Acá son funcionarios estatales y locales y federales. Vamos a pasar por todo esto. Se va a acabar esto y lo vamos a hacer juntos todos. Gracias, señor presidente. Quiero dar gracias a Chad Wolf y por Seguridad Nacional por el trabajo que hicieron los aeropuertos, que fue increíble. Eh, filtraron a millares y millares de personas. Uh, O'Hare eh, tuvo un poco de atraso, pero uh, los sacaron y todos fueron examinados y examinados cuidadosamente, no querían apurarse. Hubo tres aeropuertos uh, y fue algo increíble. Entonces tuvieron también un gran auge del Reino Unido e Irlanda, y eso todo pasó muy bien, sin problema alguno. Hicieron un trabajo muy bueno, lo hicieron un trabajo muy bien hecho. Quisiera presentarle ahora a David Menuchin y quiero entonces despedirle que se vaya, porque él va a ir al Capitolio. Él ha estado trabajando muchísimo con el Senado y en sí también con la Cámara Baja en un con paquete, un, con un conjunto de leyes muy grande, muy osado, Va a ser muy osado y muy grande, con gran entusiasmo. Lo están logrando. Nunca he visto nada semejante a lo que estamos haciendo. Uh, Steve Minuchin, por favor. Que gracias, gracias, señor presidente. Quisiera anunciar algunas acciones muy significativas que el presidente ha aprobado hoy día. La primera de ellas, primero quiero decir que hoy día le envié una carta al Powell, el uh, presidente uh, de el federal, y si en, uh, para que utilice el 133, los federales van a mandar un vehículo con propósitos especiales en lo cual el Tesoro va a invertir 10 mil millones de dólares de uno de nuestros fondos. Esto ha de permitirle a los federales garantizar la compra de A1P1. El de los A1P1 es un mercado de un millón de millones de dólares. Es importantísimo para los trabajadores estadounidenses, para los negocios estadounidenses, y es importantísimo 
a las personas que ahorran en Estados Unidos, que tienen gran parte de dinero en fondos del mercado. Eh, hay problemas de liquidez, esto es algo muy importante y vamos a creer, no creo que vamos a tener que usarlo todo, pero vamos a poder hacer que los federales compren hasta un millón de millones de dólares de papeles eh, comerciales eh, cuando se necesite. Ya se ha creado bastante estabilidad en el mercado hoy día. Lo segundo que diría yo es que saben ustedes que previamente hablamos ya sobre el deferir los pagos de, al Departamento de Rentas Internas. El presidente me anunció esta mañana que anunciara este programa. Ya previamente anuncié que vamos a deferir 200 mil millones. El presidente sugirió que aumentáramos eso a 300 mil millones de dólares que vamos a hacer. Pero quiero decir algo específicamente. Nosotros alentamos a aquellos estadounidenses que puedan plantear sus impuestos, que continúen planteando sus impuestos, sus declaraciones de impuestos el día 15 de abril, porque para muchos estadounidenses van a obtener eh, reembolsos de impuestos. Queremos que ustedes consigan esos reembolsos. Muchas personas hacen esto de manera electrónica, que es fácil para ellos y fácil para el Departamento de Rentas Internas. Si usted debe un pago, le debe un pago al Departamento de Rentas Internas, puede usted deferir hasta un millón de dólares como individuo. La razón por la cual hacemos un millón de dólares es porque esto cubre muchos diferentes pequeños negocios y 10 millones de dólares a las corporaciones, libre de intereses y libre de multas por 90 días. Todo lo que tiene que hacer usted es declarar sus impuestos automáticamente. No le van a cobrar ni intereses ni multas. Naturalmente, cualquier estadounidense tiene el derecho de extender sus impuestos. No estamos de eliminando ese derecho, pero el presidente nos ha pedido que nosotros prestemos hasta 300 mil millones de dólares. Eso es gran, una enorme cantidad de liquidez para el sistema. En tercer lugar, el presidente y yo eh, trabajamos sobre un plan de estímulos muy importante. Gracias por estar disponible anoche y esta mañana. Y yo estaré presentándole eso a los republicanos en el Senado esta mañana. Y también hablaremos con la Cámara Baja sobre esto. Estamos deseosos de tener apoyo mi parte. Dice, estamos trabajando ahora con el Senado para que se apruebe este proyecto de ley muy rápidamente. Y estos serán pagos a pequeños negocios. Hemos hablado de garantías de préstamos a industrias críticas como aerolíneas y hoteles. Y también hemos hablado de un, un paquete de, de estímulo para el trabajador estadounidense. Esto es algo como pagos por interrupción de negocios para el trabajador estadounidense. Gracias. ¿Tiene alguna pregunta para el secretario del Tesoro? ¿Hay un paquete de estímulos para los trabajadores estadounidenses? ¿Usted se refiere a pago directamente a los estadounidenses? ¿O a pesar, que, a pesar que al presidente le gusta la idea de un día feriado de impuestos sobre la nómina, muchas personas han dicho que podemos considerar esto el, los días feriados en uh, eh, impuestos sobre la nómina, le dan dinero en seis a ocho uh, meses dinero a los estadounidenses, pero queremos mandar el cheque inmediatamente a los trabajadores estadounidenses. Muchos negocios han cerrado, bares y restaurantes en los estadounidenses se necesitan efectivo ahora y el presidente quiere llevarle el dinero ahora en efectivo en las próximas dos semanas. ¿Cuánto? Yo voy a repasar esto con los republicanos. Hay ciertas cifras que se hacen un poquito más que lo que pensamos. Por favor, bueno, Pérez, un momento. ¿Qué ayuda le va a dar usted a las aerolíneas? Ya he tenido conversaciones con todas las aerolíneas, los directores ejecutivos de este y esta semana, los directores ejecutivos de las aerolíneas han tenido conversaciones con el Senado y con la Cámara Baja. Como dijo el presidente, yo estuve con el subjuego de los senadores republicanos anoche con ellos. Yo creo que, como usted sabe, esto es peor que el 911. Para la industria de las aerolíneas, esto es uh, casi uh, no vuelan. El presidente quiere cerciorarse, ya que a pesar no queremos que las personas viajen, a menos que sea de importancia crítica, queremos mantener el derecho de tener viajes domésticos si lo necesitan. ¿Cuántos miles de millones de dólares? No voy a comentar sobre lo específico. Estamos muy centrados, hay muchos trabajadores. Esto es importante estratégicamente para nosotros y vamos a trabajar con el Congreso sobre esto. La industria de las aerolíneas estará muy bien. Se ha hablado sobre cheques de mil dólares a todos los estadounidenses para aumentar apoyo entre los republicanos y demócratas. ¿Hay apoyo de republicanos y demócratas? ¿Usted respaldaría esto para todos o respaldaría usted algún tipo de restricción sobre quién recibe un cheque? Creo que es claro, no tenemos que eh, mandarle un cheque a personas que ganan uh, un millón de dólares al año. Estas son las ideas que nos gustan a nosotros. Vamos a nosotros a repasar esto hoy día y hablaremos sobre detalles más tarde. Creo que vamos a hacer algo para llevarle dinero a ellos con la mayor brevedad posible. Quizás eso no sea una manera fiel de hacerlo porque quizás eh, pero tendremos una idea bastante buena como termino el día hoy de qué vamos a hacer. Por favor, John, ¿cómo funciona esto? Estamos hablando de un recorte en los 
eh, impuestos sobre la, la, la nómina, eh, ¿cómo es que esta idea de enviarle cheques eh, con dinero para a las personas, cómo funcionaría esto? Dígame, ¿cómo funcionaría esto? Bueno, queremos cerciorarnos que los estadounidenses reciban dinero y tengan dinero rápidamente. Queremos cerciorarnos que los dueños de pequeños negocios tengan acceso a fondos. Queremos cerciorarnos que los hoteles, eh, las aerolíneas, eh, que tengamos un paquete completo y vamos a desplazar esos detalles más tarde del día. Hay cuatro diferentes maneras que se puede lograr esto. ¿Usted me escucha? Yo supongo, sí, sí. Sí, la gente en la casa, claro, son gente muy importante, yo creo. Especialmente su gente. Mira, tenemos cuatro o cinco maneras que podemos hacerlo, cuatro maneras en particular. Creo que hay una quinta posibilidad, pero hay unas maneras muy buenas de poder llevarle el dinero a ellos rápidamente. Este fue un informe especial de Noticias Univisión. sobre la sincronización de cuán rapidez piensa usted que puede lograr esto el presidente me ha instruido que tenemos que hacer esto ahora así que entonces ahora vamos a trabajar con el Senado que está en sesión en estos momentos activamente vamos a continuar teniendo conversaciones con la Cámara Baja y he hablado yo con la eh, Presidenta de la Cámara Baja Pelosi hoy día una vez el presidente me ha instruido que esto no es culpa de los trabajadores estadounidenses. Por razones médicas, estamos cerrando parte de esta economía. Vamos a usar todas las herramientas que tenemos a nuestra disposición y aquellas que no tengamos, vamos al Congreso a pedirle que nos las den. Me tengo que ir al Congreso. No queremos hablar de esto ahora, pero sí es una cifra sustancial que le vamos a dar a las aerolíneas. Lo podemos hacer de dos maneras. Podemos dárselo todos los días o todas las semanas, pero vamos a hacerlo bien grande, de manera bien grande. Eh, Mitch McConnell quiere hacer esto, eso es lo que yo quiero hacer. Lo quiero hacer ya para tener una gran infusión en vez de ir poco a poco, reunioncitas a cada par de días. No queremos hacerlo de esta manera. Queremos hacerlo grande, de manera sólida. El país está muy fuerte. Nunca hemos estado tan fuerte. Eso es lo que vamos a estar haciendo. No queremos, eh, con este enemigo invisible, no queremos que las aerolíneas cierren sus negocios. No queremos que las personas pierdan su negocio y que no tengan dinero para vivir, como estaban teniendo muy buen resultado hace cuatro semanas atrás. Vamos a hacer las cosas grandemente. Así parece que lo vamos a hacer. A todos en el Congreso les gusta esto. Hay hoteles, restaurantes, eh, eh, se habló algo sobre esto. Muchos restaurantes tuvieron que cerrar a pesar de que están entregando la comida, no están ganando tanto como antes. Quiero hacer dos comentarios, dos comentarios sobre el restaurante. Y el presidente comprende esto, esto se recalcó esta mañana. En primer lugar, queremos cerciorarnos que los estados le permitan a las ventanillas a donde se puede ir en su auto, que se mantengan abiertas, especialmente en este tiempo cuando decimos a las personas no vayan a restaurantes. Estas empresas alimentan gran parte de los estadounidenses y espero que van a continuar alimentando a un mayor número de estadounidenses. Lo, primer, lo segundo que me pidieron que recalcara, no lo iba a hacer ahora, pero ya que usted me preguntó, muchas de estas empresas tienen aplicaciones. Usted puede ordenar con enteración de esa manera como usted llega ya, tan sencillo como que ya la tienen empacada, se la pueden dar a usted con distancia social y será muy rápido. Así que esperamos que ellos podrán alimentar a una gran parte de la población. Y con respecto a apoyo, yo diré que muchos de estos negocios son pequeños negocios, empresas, franquicias, 500 o menos, y tenemos un programa específico que vamos a develar para que ayude a todos los negocios, pequeños y medio tamaño, de 500 o menos. Con la corporación Marriott, ahora está dejando 60 millares de individuos debido al impacto de coronavirus. Su legislación ayudará a esos individuos. Espero que sí. Esas son las razones por las cuales tenemos que actuar muy rápidamente, porque comprendemos si sean las aerolíneas, hoteles, por buenas razones para protegernos de Estados Unidos sobre asuntos médicos. Estos negocios están cerrando. El presidente quiere cerciorarse, como yo dije. Usaremos todo el poder posible en nuestras manos. Ustedes vieron esto hoy. Uh, mil de mi, mi, millones de millones de dólares de posible liquidez para el mercado. Y quiero decirle que hay mucho apoyo bipartidistas para estas cosas. Le pido excusas, pero me tengo que ir. Lo siento, me tengo que marchar. Está bien, señor presidente. Gracias. Sí quiero comentar sobre esto. Bien. 
Definitivamente creemos en que los mercados tienen que mantenerse abiertos. Los estadounidenses tienen que saber que tienen acceso a su dinero. Después del 11 de septiembre, la única razón por la que los mercados se cerraron fue debido a la tecnología, se interrumpió. Yo he estado en el teléfono, por teléfono, hablando con los bancos principales de la bolsa de valores. Todos quieren dejarla abierta. Va, llegamos a un momento cuando recortemos las horas y hay que hacerlo, pero los estadounidenses deben saber que vamos a hacer todo lo posible para asesorarlos, que ellos tengan acceso en sus dineros, en sus bancos, en sus 401 cash y en sus acciones. Quiero decir claramente que tenemos intenciones de mantener los mercados abiertos y los bancos están tan fuertes como nunca antes han estado tan fuertes. Un evento muy diferente que lo que tuvimos hace no tanto tiempo atrás. John, go ahead, John, presidente, usted mencionó el cuerpo de ingenieros del ejército. Usted conversó con el gobernador Cuomo. A Nueva York va a se le están acabando las camas hospitales de Nueva York. ¿Está usted listo para movilizarlos? Sí, estamos comenzando el proceso. Es un proceso que espero no sea necesario, pero pudiera ser necesario. El Estado está trabajando también ellos sobre esto. Probablemente vamos a suplementar lo que ellos están haciendo. Dado el hecho de que muchos de los precursores de los farmacéuticos vienen de la China, y han habido interrupción en la cadena de eh, provisiones. ¿Usted cree que vamos a tener un faltante de fármacos recetados? No lo veo. Ya, yo creo que China tiene todo incentivo de cerciorarse de que todo funcione bien. China quiere cerciorarse de que las cosas funcionen muy bien. Ellos tienen todos los incentivos para hacerlo. Jeff, el gobierno de Ohio he eh, eh, pedido que no se lleve a cabo la primaria. Ahora, ¿está usted de acuerdo con esa decisión? ¿Qué paso está tomando usted para cerciorarse que las elecciones de aquí en adelante, si esta pandemia continúa, que las elecciones puedan ocurrir, incluyendo el gobernador está haciendo las cosas muy bien hecho. Él decidió no tener la primaria. Ahora y veremos qué ocurre. No se ha determinado cuándo se tendrá lugar, pero si él dijo que no iba a haber la primaria, lo entiendo. Él definitivamente es alguien que sabe lo que está haciendo. Veremos a ver muy pronto. Uh, ellos siguen la regla de 10 en vez de la regla de 50. Y es bastante difícil. Yo diría que probablemente se puede quebrantar esto si quiere para una elección, pero yo creo que una elección es algo muy especial. Él eligió otra fecha diferente en junio, creo. Por eso será una decisión tomada por él. Él pensó que era necesario. Los tribunales, alguien lo está desafiando, así que el tribunal va a decidirlo. ¿Qué está haciendo usted para cerciorarse que otras elecciones, si seguimos en esta situación de aquí a un mes, de aquí a dos meses? Lo, lo que yo estoy haciendo, George, es muy sencillo. Estamos eliminando este virus, es lo que estamos haciendo, lo mejor que podemos hacer. Le quiero decir, para los mercados es muy sencillo, muy sencillo, la solución es muy sencilla. Queremos eliminarlo, queremos tener el menor número de muertes posible. Esto es algo horrible. Si vemos lo que está ocurriendo en Italia, no queremos estar en una posición como esa allá, pero mucho mayor, porque somos un país mucho mayor, pero no queremos llegar a eso. Creo que hemos tenido muy buenos resultados. Nosotros hemos tenido muy buenos resultados. Los estados han tenido muy buenos resultados. Todos estamos, todos, todos estamos trabajando juntos. Lo mejor es eliminar el virus. Una vez que se elimine esto, vamos a volver a recuperarnos como nunca antes ha visto. Esa es mi opinión, pero yo creo que se va a recuperar como nunca antes ha visto antes. Para darle seguimiento a la pregunta que se hizo, especialmente estas nuevas instalaciones hospitalarias, ¿cuántas puede construir el Cuerpo de Ingenieros del Ejército? ¿Y qué medidas está usando usted para aumentar el número de respiradores pulmonares? Hemos, hemos pedido una cifra masiva de respiradores pulmonares. Tenemos una gran cantidad de ellos, tenemos una gran cantidad de equipos, tremenda cantidad. Pero comparado con lo que estamos hablando aquí ahora, nunca esto se ha hecho antes y ayer. Le dio a los gobernadores el derecho de ordenar directamente si ellos lo quieren, si piensan que lo pueden hacer con mayor rapidez y no ir a través del gobierno federal. Ya nosotros eliminamos toda la burocracia, es algo muy directo, pero siempre es más rápido usarlo, ordenarlo directamente. Yo le di a ellos eh, orden que pudieran hacer esto, pero desafortunadamente el New York Times lo uh, uh, divulgó de manera errónea, desafortunadamente. El presidente nos instruyó que trabajemos con el Departamento de Defensa. Hay dos maneras que el Departamento de Defensa puede ayudarlos para desarrollar la capacidad médica. El gobernador de Nueva York nos ha pedido que nosotros veamos a ver si podemos usar el cuerpo de ingenieros del ejército, que se puede renovar edificios existentes. El presidente también nos tiene haciendo un inventario, lo que ustedes pueden entender como hospitales de campo de ter sobre el terreno que pueden ser eh, desplegados rápidamente. Hablamos con el gobernador del estado de Washington 
Washington ayer. Tenemos recursos en esta parte del país que podemos mover y al pedir esto a los gobernadores, por los procesaremos, se lo llevaremos al presidente para que estudie esto, pero hay diferentes maneras que puede proveer el DOD, Departamento de Defensa, de esto, aparte de todas las uh, provisiones médicas que están en Reserva Nacional. El presidente evalúa esto, uh, va a considerar todas las peticiones de los gobernadores, ya sea para hospitales de campo, desarrollar las instalaciones ya, o el cuerpo de ingenieros que puede uh, uh, modificar los uh, edificios actuales. Este cuerpo de ingenieros del ejército puede hacer esto rápidamente. Y sí, le llaman hospitales uh, del sobre el terreno en caso uh, uh, para el uso del ejército. Tenemos esto, tenemos todos estos equipos almacenados. Estamos estudiando diferentes sitios, diferentes ubicaciones. No se van a necesitar en uh, el estado de West Virginia, donde aún no hay ningún, no hay ningún brote. Big Jim, el gobernador, tiene que estar haciendo las cosas bien hechas. ¿eh? Eso fue lo que se reportó. Eso es porque no se ha reportado correctamente o porque no tienen casos. Yo realmente veo que West Virginia no tiene caso alguno. No sé, así que obviamente se está tratando definitivamente que en Nueva York y en California, en diferentes partes de California. Sí le quiero decir lo siguiente, el Cuerpo de Ingenieros del Ejército está listo, dispuesto, y tenemos que darle solamente el, la luz verde cuando creamos que esté necesario. Podemos tener varias unidades montadas rápidamente. Voy a trabajar con el gobernador Cuomo, voy a trabajar con uh, un número de los gobernadores. El gobernador Newsom ha sido muy generoso en sus palabras, y yo soy generoso con él también. Todos estamos trabajando juntos muy bien. Creo que muchas cosas positivas han tenido lugar. Estamos hablando con California sobre diferentes asuntos, pero podemos tener muchas unidades montadas rápidamente si pensamos que se van a necesitar. Creo que lo que voy a hacer es que quizás le pida a Simen que diga algunas palabras sobre la telesalud y entonces volveremos a esto. Gracias, señor presidente. Este fue un informe especial de Noticias Univisión. Thank you, Mr. President. And as the President announced earlier, we are doing a dramatic expansion of what's known as telehealth for our 62 million Medicare beneficiaries who are amongst the most vulnerable to the coronavirus. And we're acting in accord with the appropriations bill that was signed on March 6th, as well as the President's emergency declaration last week. And this action is a part of our broader effort to ensure that government requirements, rules, and regulations don't get in the way of patient care during an emergency. And today's announcement builds on the significant progress that the President has already made over the past three years around telehealth services. And while we have allowed for virtual check-ins, full telehealth benefits have been restricted to those living in rural areas, established patients, and just for those brief visits. But no longer, Medicare beneficiaries across the nation, no matter where they live, will now be able to receive a wide range of services via telehealth without ever having to leave home. And these services can also be provided in a variety of settings, including nursing homes, hospital outpatient departments, and more. And thanks to the leadership of HHS, we'll also be temporarily relaxing certain HIPAA requirements so that doctors can provide telehealth with their own phones, and we'll be using enforcement discretion when it comes to collecting copays so that cost won't be a barrier. This is a part of our larger efforts around mitigation. And as we are encouraging Americans to stay home whenever possible, we don't want our Medicare policies getting in the way. And so consider the implications of this. Perhaps an elderly patient with diabetes needs a routine checkup. And this has nothing to do with the coronavirus. And so with our new telehealth benefits, this person who's not really, uh, who's at risk for the coronavirus doesn't have to venture outside their home. They can talk to their doctor via Skype, and they don't have to risk exposure to the virus, and they can receive that care from the safety of their own home. It could be another Medicare recipient who's experiencing mild flu-like symptoms, and instead of leaving the house and sitting in a waiting room full of other vulnerable people, they can also receive advice uh, from their doctor from their home. And this shift is very important for clinicians and providers who over the coming weeks will face considerable strain on their time and resources. And now Medicare patients who don't absolutely need to come in to an office won't have to. And this allows the healthcare system to prioritize for care for those that are more in, that have more needs or in dire need and preserves protective equipment as well. Um, state Medicaid agencies can also provide telehealth services 
without federal approval, and so we're asking all states to make this available as well. And we've also asked private insurance companies to expand their telehealth benefits and make it clear to their providers and, the, and their members what they cover. As our nation seeks to balance the twin imperatives of getting Americans the care that they need during this outbreak and limiting the spread of the virus, the impact of this historic action simply cannot be overstated. In an emergency, those on the front line shouldn't have to worry about federal rules and red tape, hamstringing them when they need flexibility above all else. And we're doing everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen. I also just want to briefly mention that because of the President's emergency declaration, we do have the ability to provide a lot of Medicaid waivers, and Florida was the first state to be approved. We were able to do that in a matter of days. Thank you. Any, any questions, yes. please? Where, where do you see your citizens go for instructions on how to do the telehealth? They should call their doctor's office, and their doctor's office can tell them how to do that. Um, also, you know, there may be some of our uh, Medicare members that may not have access to equipment, so we're asking family members but to help with this, but also respecting the requirements around social distancing, and if any of those family members or neighbors have symptoms, they should obviously stay Will away. Will you be posting numbers also? That's correct, That might exactly. be the easiest way to do it. Yes. If you post uh, in ads, if you post some numbers. And they can also call our 1-800-MEDICARE number, and they can also get information. Those phone lines are open. Thank you. Thank you very much. Admiral, if you'd say a few words about where we're going, and then I'd like to ask Dr. Burks to say a couple of words about how, uh, how the system's working. Well, thank you very much. Um, as we talked about earlier this week, uh, the commercial system is rapidly uh, advancing in the testing capabilities. Um, as of today, our public health laboratories, meaning the CDC and the public health labs, have reported out 31,878 tests, so almost 32,000 tests. The clinical laboratories, the Association of Clinical Laboratories, um, have reported out 20, about 27,000 tests. And most importantly, of those 27,000 during the cumulative period of time, 8,200 of them were yesterday. This is showing the dramatic ramp as the high throughput comes in. We don't have the numbers this morning from the American Hospital Association, which means all the individual hospital laboratories. We will have that upcoming in the next day or so. And then Ambassador Burks will have this whole process uh, 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 fixed under with the legislation that everything will roll up into a common reporting probably by the end of next week. In terms of our drive through laboratories, again, these are blossoming all over the country uh, by individual states. The ones that we are heavily involved in and really pushing equipment to, we expect over the next few days to begin setting up 47 of these in approximately 12 states. Um, the material is already palletized and being shipped. Uh, to the locations. Most cities have the specific locations. Some do not, but it's still going to a central receiving. And we know that we'll be uh, deploying at least 140 Commission Corps officers. Uh, about half of the sites have reported their requirements. About 140 officers will be going. We expect that to go up. So this is going on uh, the way we expected. We did a trial site yesterday with a full mobile unit for drive through uh, with full PPE. Uh, we had a lot of kinks in the system, as you can expect. That's why we do uh, a, a test before we go out into the field. Uh, don't expect these to be 100% perfect the moment they come. They're going to be adapted to the state and the local situation, but we're very confident that these will add testing to the already very robust healthcare system and commercial system. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you Admiral. And this has never been done before, and it sets a great roadmap for future. Uh, should we have something like this in the future? I hope we don't. Uh, but it's never been done before, and uh, they've done an incredible job. And again, we're working with the states and relying on the states. We have to because they, they have its point of sale, its point of sight, and uh, we're in. I think just about every instance getting along really well with the uh, with the states. If I could, uh, Dr. Burks, if you could say a couple of words, please. Great, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. So I think what you've been hearing from us is to find solutions that are high quality and sustainable based on the frontline workers and governor's requests. And I, those come in on the governor's call, we've been immediately responsive to those. And that's the, the level of red tape and bureaucracy that we have removed. I think that point about sustainability and quality is very important because as the president says, we're creating a roadmap for a different level of functionality for future pandemics. 
our flu pandemic preparedness plan was a plan. Now we're seeing where we have to revise, where we have to create new avenues of research, new avenues of work to really ensure that the need of the American people can be reached. We were adamant about having a high quality test based on our commercial vendors. Over the next few months, you will begin to see that other tests that were utilized around the world were not of the same quality, resulting in false positives and potentially false negatives. These tests were studied and studied by the FDA to really ensure that they are that level of quality. And we've given the states the permission to ensure that same level of quality. Now I want to just say one minute on the testing. Testing should not be used as an assessment of your risk. We are asking every single American, no matter what your generation, from Z and up to X and millennials in between, to really ensure that you're following these guidelines. We hear every night of people who are not in work moving that time into bars and other areas of large gatherings. If we continue with that process, we will fail in containing this virus. So every single generation has a role to play. We're asking our older generation to stay in their homes. And we're asking the younger generations to support them in social contacting through videos and other Skype type functions, or just the simple telephone. We're asking the younger generations to stop going out in public places to bars and restaurants and spreading asymptomatic virus onto countertops and knobs and grocery stores and grocery carts. I heard an innovation last night and this morning again on the news. I really want to applaud the private sector who are now creating senior-only shopping times. I think that's extraordinary. I think that shows what America brings. And I think other countries will learn from us about how to really protect seniors in this type of way. I'm hoping it carries through to next year when we have our flu epidemic, where we can really have a very different pro profile of the amount of mortality that we have during flu that we never talk about. Anywhere from 15,000 to 45,000 individuals are lost every year. If we learn how to do this well, and sustain some of those core changes, we can change the way respiratory viruses, not only for this, but the future, affect Americans. It's a big thing. A question on the clinical data. So we, we've had now roughly 5,000 people test positive. We've had uh, 90 deaths or so. When are we going to know the data of who those people are? who has been infected, what the ages are, what the pre-existing conditions are, how serious it was, both for those uh, who, who have been tested positive, uh, but also those who have died. Well, you are singing my sheet of music. I'm very data-oriented, so thank you for bringing up this issue of data. I really want to applaud HHS. Um, we had a discussion about this several days ago. They've made calls into Seattle and California to really understand that, and also importantly to understand how many of their patients needed ventilators, how many of them needed um, oxygen support, how many of them needed and what they needed. Could we predict early someone who was going to have a more difficult course? These are all the questions we're asking right and answering right now. We did get an early report back from Santa Clara and Seattle. We're digesting it. We just got it this morning. We're looking at that carefully because we think that roadmap is very important to other communities. We have not discussed this with New York yet. We do know from other countries, and that all is available online, that profile. Um, you can see that mortality under 30 is extraordinarily low. The mortality across the board outside of Wuhan is now settling somewhere around 0.7. But that should not be reassuring because it's much higher in people with pre-existing medical conditions, even if young, and people that are older with pre-existing medical conditions. And so we still want every American focused on doing what they can do today to change the course of this pandemic. We committed to making that data public so we will all know. We're committed not only to making it public, but to have a website that everyone can see in real time. Dr. Burks, Dr. Dr. Burks, Dr. Burks, Dr. Burks if I could just follow up. The, there, you all are signaling a much more aggressive posture uh, toward containment mitigation now. Uh, and many states have been very aggressive. But there is a small number of states that has not uh, have not issued public guidance to their residents. 
is it important for the success of the effort that 100 percent of the states uh, be forward-leaning on this? And uh, if so, Mr. President, what would be your message to those states that have not? Okay. So that's why the Vice President and the President yesterday issued those critical guidelines. As I said this morning on Fox and Friends, you can look at them as guidelines, you can look at them as requirements, and you can look at them as the President asking every American and every state to follow those. That's why we put them out at the federal level. We wanted to make sure every American knew what they could do today to change the course of this epidemic. I think it's empowering. I think it says all of us have a social responsibility um, to each other, and that's why we believe that every mayor and every governor should be instituting these guidelines that came from the White House and the President of the United States. And we've been very tough in those states. I know exactly who you're talking about. We've been very tough on them. Thank you. Please, go ahead. On the testing, you've been telling us for days now that millions of tests have been sent out. So why have fewer than 60,000 people actually been tested? I think you will see different numbers this week. You heard just at 8,000. Remember, all of these tests, the high-speed tests, were approved last Friday, last Friday night, and last Thursday night. I think if I could talk to Thermo Fisher and the other groups that have these platforms out there, do not rely on a pull technology push out those tests. Um, because we can only make them available, groups have to order them. So I, we've been talking to Thermo Fisher, one of the key platforms, to push out tests based on need and not wait for orders. And is that where the issue is, getting the tests out, or is it getting the tests conducted? We, that's a great question. I know part of it is getting the test out right now. I think the Admiral and others are working on getting the the issues related to getting the test conducted. Obviously, that does take time. He is working on innovative solutions that are creative and sustainable that will be a game changer in testing, but we don't have the data yet. This is a critical comparator. Can you do it yourself? Can you actually sample yourself? These, these are the kinds of things we're working on right now, and he's getting the data for us. And the states are actually doing a lot of it. The governors and the states are doing a lot of it. With even our tests. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you give us a sense of how long these tough new restrictions will need to be in place until we start to see uh, the rate of this virus going down? And also, can you speak to this study that as many as 2.2 million people in the United States could die if there weren't this type of uh, action by the government taken? That so, that we saw yesterday. I think, you know, models are models, and they're based on input, and they're based on infectiousness without any controls. Um, I can tell you we've never seen that level of infections that modeled up to that 2.2 um, million in mortality. So we are looking at that. We are having a particularly model meeting tomorrow. I think that's really going to be important. Um, I've dealt with a lot of modelers in my time. They're wonderful people. Um, but they all have their favorite inputs and they all have their favorite integration functions. So we're evaluating all of those so we can integrate and create the best model for the United States based on the best data. And that first set of recommendations you saw were based on what we could do today to prevent anything that looks like that. If I could just say one other thing to the hospitals and dentists out there. Things that don't need to be done over the next two weeks, don't get it done. If you're a person with an electric sur elective surgery, you don't want to go into a hospital right now. There's a lot of distraction. Um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of other things to save people's lives. So let's all be responsible and cancel things that we can cancel to really free up hospital beds and space. And then let's do everything that we can to ensure that we don't need the ventilators because we protected the people who would have needed to use them. And are you looking at the possibility of more actions like, for example, limiting travel within the United States? Are you looking it's at... It's possible. It's possible. We'll see how it goes. I think a lot of... There's been great cooperation with uh, local governments, states. Uh, we'll see how it goes. It's yeah. going... It's going right now pretty well. Yeah, please, go ahead. Can I follow on that, Mr. President, please. very quickly? Yeah. Just very quickly. Do you need to invoke the Defense Production Act to get more of those medical supplies to different hospitals? Well, we're able to do that if we have to. Right now, we haven't had to, but it's certainly ready. If I want it, we can do it very quickly. We've studied it very closely over two weeks ago, actually. Uh, we'll make that decision pretty quickly if we need it. We hope we don't need it. Do the 
it's a big step. Need more help from the federal government well, when it comes to those. Supplies. You know, when you what say you the say states, uh, in particular, three states need some help, and uh, some states, you know, have two people, three people, no people, in the case of again West Virginia. So uh, we're looking at it very closely. Uh, we've uh, taken it apart 15 different ways. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's a very big step, and if we need that step, we'll take it. Okay. Quick, quick follow on Kristen, so first question: A lot of people have got travel to places that aren't considered hot spots, yeah. the Caribbean, Mexico, that sort of thing, over the next few weeks. Would you recommend that they follow through with those plans? I, I would just say, uh, enjoy your home, stay. I would just say, right now, uh, we we have to get this problem fixed, and then we'll get back into business real, really quick. We'll open up our country will open up our society. The world will hopefully open up. We see uh, areas of the world that are that haven't done well, and we see areas that are doing very well. And I would put us in the category of doing very well uh, for a country so big. Uh, I think that uh, I would recommend that they just enjoy their living room. John. Yeah, go ahead, please. What do you say to people who are not heeding these guidelines from the White House? And then also I have a question on asymptomatic people yeah, sure. Dr. Burst. I'm, I'm not happy with those people if they're not. But, you know, those people are being shouted down by other people. They know it. They're being uh, – it's almost like self-policing. People went in. There are a couple of instances, I guess, probably more than a couple, where people are not happy when they see others doing what they're not supposed to be doing. We have to get rid of this. We have to win this war, and ideally quickly, quickly, because the longer it takes, it's uh, not a good situation. And I'm not even talking about the economy. I'm talking about the lives of a lot of people. Yeah, please. Did you have one? put any restrictions on uh, corporate bonuses for companies that do get bailed out like airlines? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, – I think I'm going to ask Mike to answer that question. I think it's all a work in progress. What President Trump uh, has made clear to industries around the country is that we're going to do whatever it takes. Uh, we understand this is an extraordinary moment uh, in the life of our nation. It's the reason why the President brought in leaders of the financial sector, airline industry. He'll meet with all – additional industry leaders today in tourism and hospitality. But he has tasked the Secretary of the Treasury to work with members of Congress in both parties to make sure that we construct the kind of economic uh, support uh, that will allow those industries to weather uh, the period of the coronavirus and then to come back stronger than ever before. We've had, we've had such incredible um, – I don't know. It's almost the word spirit is the best word. It's like a spirit. Uh, the banks have come in, and the banks are doing things that they would have never done. They're working on extensions and lots of things that they wouldn't have done. Uh, co-pays with regard to the insurance companies. I mean, f for them to be doing what they're doing, you know all about the co-pays. They would have never done that, and they did it. They were in my office. They, uh, I would say, the 11 biggest in this country. I guess probably the 11 biggest in the world. The big ones, all the big ones, and they – they uh, did things on copay that nobody would be doing that they wouldn't have done in a million years, but they're doing it. There's a great spirit going on right now in the country. So you want to uh, yes, please, Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci, you've said you like being accused of overreacting because uh, that is an indication we may be doing things necessary to beat this, bend the curve. Right. How long do you think it will take for you to be confident that? Yes, we're bending the curve, or no, we're not. You know, I can't give you a firm number on that because the dynamics of outbreaks, in some respects, are predictable historically. They do this and that. We don't know because this is really unprecedented. I mean, of all the outbreaks that I've been involved with over the last at least 36 years and then going historically back, we've never had a situation where the mobilization of all the different components – travel restrictions, internal containment, mitigation, financial assistance, public health assistance, testing. So we don't really know. But the one thing I do know, I do know that if you look at models with all of their vicissitudes of models, is that when you have input into the kinds of mitigations and things that we're doing, uh, we're going to see a hump instead of a peak. I would be really surprised if all the things that we're doing, and, and this is really a, a comprehensive approach. I was struck as I was listening to everyone make their, their presentations that, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a, a health person, and I'm a physician who sees patients. So I look at it from one particular standpoint. But 
what I'm being impressed by is that this is really a comprehensive thing that has multiple components to it. All of them got to succeed if we're going to get to that end point that I've described multiple times from this podium. So I hope that if everyone does their job, we're going to be able to give you a number and say, you know, we've seen that inflection and we're coming down. I would hesitate to do it now, to, to be honest with you, because um, it might be misleading, and I don't want to be misleading. I, I just want to say one other thing, because I heard Dr. Burke say it, and I think we need to say it over and over again. When I was young, a long time ago, I felt that I was invulnerable, the way I think many of us feel we're invulnerable. And when we're asking the young people to help us with this mitigation strategy by staying out of the bars, staying out of the restaurants, really trying to distance yourself, don't get the attitude, well, I'm young, I'm invulnerable. You are, well, in some respects, you're certainly less vulnerable than I am. However, what you might inadvertently do, and I know you don't want to do that, you don't want to put your loved ones at risk, particularly the ones who are elderly and the ones who have compromised conditions. We can't do this without the young people cooperating. Please cooperate with us. Thank you. We're in untested patients with mild to no symptoms. So what does that say about the impact of testing, and does it mean that testing should actually go beyond the sickest patients? You know, that question keeps coming up, and I'm not going to evade the question, but I want to make a point. We tend to think that we're not going to be able to mitigate or contain without testing. They complement each other in some respects, but they're separate channels. Even if we had no testing, we should be doing what we're doing now. The question you're asking, so I won't evade it specifically, would it be important outside of a doctor-patient coming in together of knowing what's out there, what might be under the radar screen? The answer to your question is yes. So let me tell you what the CDC is doing right now. They're going out there, and part of their program is to get a feel for what is there that wasn't initially thought to be coronavirus. That was thought to be something else. When you do that, you're also going to get a feel of what the penetrance is in society. So we are heading with the high throughput things that you've been hearing about to get an answer to your question. Um, Governor Cuomo said this morning uh, he believes that we'll see a peak in terms of infection in 45 days. Would you concur with that? You know, it's possible. I mean, I, I know that the, the governor has been really... I, I believe, doing a really good job of trying to stay ahead of this. 45 days is not unreasonable. You have to be careful. When you get a number, you own the number, and then if the number doesn't come out, you're in trouble. And that's the reason why, from our standpoint, from the federal government, we're talking about a range. So within that range, I mean, it isn't like you want to be correct for the sake of being correct, but you don't want to be wed to something and then have to back off. Uh, what's the range? Go ahead, please. When is when is the soonest that we'll know that these new guidelines are actually bending the curve or actually working? Uh, and is there a point in time where you, you know, in the next couple of weeks where you'll be able to tell the president more draconian measures are needed? Well, okay, so what's happening, I mean, if you look as a metaphor, it's kind of like a race against the virus. If left to its own devices, we'll do this. And us trying to somehow blunt that. Now, you could see the virus going up and up, and your effect, your, your work, what you're trying to do, may actually be having an effect, but you may not see it because it'll still be going up. And as you're trying to uh, implement your, your, your interference with the virus, you may not realize that you are actually interfering. And you'll say, wait a minute, it's still going up. What's going on? You've done nothing. But you don't know whether it would do this versus that. So the answer to your question, it probably would be several weeks and maybe longer before we know whether we're having an effect. It may be at the end of the day, we'll see a curve that would have been way, way up. But I wouldn't, like, put us to task every few days. Well, wait a minute, it's going up. Is it working or not? That would be really misleading if we do that. Guidelines which were announced yesterday. One of those guidelines was a recommendation 
against gatherings of 10 or more people. And today, the governor of Alabama issued her own guidelines, and it was a recommendation against gatherings of 25 right. or more people. Um, what is your recommendation for people of Alabama, people across all of the country, as far as the guidelines that were announced yesterday by the federal government? Okay. So the one thing we don't want to do is to get hung up on the difference between 10 and 25. I think you might agree with that. When we give guidelines, they're only guidelines. We sit down, we look at the data, as Dr. Burke said, we're data-driven, and we say, on different models, 10 looks good. If someone wants to do 25, we're not going to fault them, but if someone wants to come to us and ask us what we think the best is, we stand by the numbers. It isn't perfect. It isn't precise math. It's assumptions and it's data that make you get your decision. But would, be more, would it be more effective if every state and every city in the country was playing by the same rules yes, instead of Yes, of course. But this is the United States of America. There's a lot of free enterprise there. People do their own thing. And quite frankly, I don't think there's a big deal difference between 10 and 25. We got many, many more important things to worry about than that difference. Mr. President, thank you. Going back to supply chains and then talking about preparedness for the future, yesterday Larry Kudlow said that there is an idea floating around the administration to cut taxes for companies who would be bringing their supply chains back to the United States. He said he specifically liked immediate 100% write-offs for right. structures, equipment, but he said you hadn't endorsed that yet. Would you endorse an idea like that? We're looking that? at many ideas. That's one of them, frankly. And we're looking at uh, creating incentives for companies, not only that type of company, but other companies. Uh, we're also looking to help uh, companies such as the airline industry within the airline industry, and we'll be doing that. We will be doing that. This is not their fault, uh, and they've been very understanding, actually, and we're going to be helping them. We will have a very powerful airline industry, and it'll start up as soon as this is over. We'll, we'll, have, those, uh, we'll have those planes ready to go. So we have to help them during the short term. We're very important. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to know, have you taken a look at some of these models, such as the Imperial College London model, uh, that kind of poses a very difficult choice, whether it's shutting down society or <clears throat> overwhelming the health care right. system? Is that something that we've looked at every model? Uh, we've relied on the very talented people, and there's no better team than the people be behind me. And I will say that uh, all of the people that have done those models are all in constant touch with uh, Dr. Burks and uh, Tony and everybody that you've been hearing uh, so much from over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've looked at we've looked at many different models, and the model we have is we want to save a lot of lives. We want to save a lot of lives. If we get too steep on that curve, you're going to lose a lot of lives, perhaps unnecessarily. Now, we're going to find out. If everything has a risk. We're going to see. But if people do what we're telling them to do, what we're asking them to do, you're going to see the saving of a lot of lives. Now, Boris, uh, in U.K. yesterday, you saw what happened. Uh, it looked like they were going a different way, but then he went away of similar — I guess similar. I don't know exactly, but I, I would say we had a conversation yesterday. Uh, similar to what we're doing. So a lot of people seem to think this is going to be we — are, we are looking to save the maximum number of lives. Everything else is going to come back. A life is never going to come back. But everything else, our economy is going to come roaring back. You're going to know. We're going to know. We're going to all know that day. If somebody was asking about the day, when will you know? When will you know? We're going to know. All of a sudden, we're going to say, wow, that's looking good. That's looking good. That's looking good. And we're going to be on the other side of the curve. And that's a day that we look forward to. Is okay. something, sir, that like you saw this week, though, that, that, that made you decide that, yes, now is the time to implement these much more uh, stringent social distancing measures? This no, I don't think so. This is where we were going. I, I really think from the beginning, this is where we were going. This is what we had in mind. Uh, we were just, we're just going step by step. That was the next step, the next logical step. Uh, as uh, Dr. Fauci said, and I think very importantly, uh, one of the most important things when you write the history of this was the fact that we closed it down to China and Europe, but in particular China. We closed it down to China, the source, very, very early, very, very early, far earlier than even the great professionals wanted to do. And I think in the end, that's going to be — that will have saved a tremendous number of lives. Um, one on the economy and the other on the broader picture here, but just to follow up on my colleague. Some people did note that your tone seemed more somber yesterday. You talked about that August timeline. 
Did you see a projection? Some people thought perhaps that two million potentially that could die maybe prompted part of that. Was there a shift in tone? I didn't think, I mean, I have seen that where people uh, actually liked it, but I didn't feel different. I've always known this is a, this is a real, this is a pandemic. I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. All you had to do is look at other countries. I think now it's in almost 120 countries all over the world. Uh, no, I've always viewed it as very serious. There was no difference yesterday from days before. I feel the tone is similar, but uh, some people said it wasn't. Former economic advisor said almost 100 percent chance of a recession. Do you see it that way? It could be. I mean, I, I don't think in terms of recession. I, I think in terms of getting it out because uh, when we're finished with the virus, we will win. We will win. And when that victory takes place, our economy is going to go through the roof. Sure. It is so pent up. It is so built up. It is so ready to go uh, in a in an upward direction. Uh, but we have to knock out this enemy. This is a really tough enemy, but we have to knock out all of us. That's all of us. So I don't think in terms of recession, not recession, it, it's words. We have to knock out this, and we will have an economy. I actually think we'll have an economy like we've never had before. It's all pent up. Did you have something to say, Mike? Yes. Well, I think the question about, about the actions that the President's authorized, beginning in January, when he took the unprecedented step of suspending all travel from China, uh, the efforts to uh, uh, issue travel advisories for portions of Italy and South Korea, and then to begin screening all the passengers, and the efforts regarding suspending travel for Europe and what went into effect at midnight last night, adding the U.K. and Ireland to that, have all been informed by the experts that are surrounding us. What the President's asked us to do from the very beginning, uh, as uh, Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci often say, is let's follow the data, uh, bring the President the best options in response to what is actually happening on the ground, um, but, uh, but with regard to yesterday's 15-day uh, uh, slow the spread plan, uh, our team unanimously brought to the President these very strong recommendations for every American because we truly believe we are at a point in this epidemic in our country when we can reduce the number of people that actually uh, are exposed to or contract the coronavirus. Uh, but uh, we'll continue to bring the best data, the best evidence and the best recommendations, frankly, of the best health experts in the world, and the President will continue to make decisions that put the health of America first. In other words, reduce the number of people that die. That's what we're trying to do. And when you do the steep curve, a lot of people are going to die. A lot of people. You know, the worst ever, they say, 1918, and I don't have to go into the numbers, but they were unbelievable numbers. Had they known and had they done what we had, now, it would have been a very much different story. It would still be tragic, but it would have been a very much different. But that was, uh, that was the one that uh, people write about. That was an incredible, uh, that was an incredible pandemic like uh, we haven't seen. But uh, we, have, uh, we have done something that uh, I, I hope, hopefully, we will all have made the right moves. We're all in this together, including you. And uh, we want to see fair press. And, and I tell you what, it's been, uh, generally speaking, I think it's been, uh, uh, it's been a great thing to see. It's been very, very — the, the uh, getting along with Democrats, getting along with Republicans, for the Democrats themselves, uh, there's been a lot of spirit. There's been a lot of things happening that I haven't seen happen in the first uh, almost now three and a half years. It's been very nice to see. That's one of the good things. But what really the good thing is we have to knock it out. We have to win. And we want to keep that slope as low as possible, because that's a lot of lives in there. Uh, let's go back there for somebody that didn't you get one, please. Go ahead. Mr. President, um, this has had a huge impact on China's economy as well. Have you received any indication from officials there that they're going to have trouble meeting the purchase agreements, part of the phase one deal, particularly the yeah. agricultural buy? Well, they need our product very badly. And uh, no, I haven't received any. We have good relationship with China. Uh, I have not received anything to that. No, we have a signed agreement. They're going to be buying, and they have been buying a lot of product. Yeah, please. Earlier today, Dr. Burks was talking about the possibility of our hospital system being overburdened, overtaxed, and she talked about certain options that are available to the United States sure. if that happens, including VA hospitals, right. uh, Department of Defense medical treatment facilities, and even hospital ships. 
At what point do you tap in to those options? Well, I'll know the point. And by speaking with Governor Cuomo and other governors, we're going to know the point. It's going to be different for New York than it's going to be from, you know, Iowa or from Idaho or from West Virginia, frankly, or for, you know, it's, it's different. Uh, New York has got a big problem. The state of Washington has a big problem. California has some big problems. Uh, everyone's doing a good job. But we're going to know when it will be. And I believe it'll be more spot than it will be. It's not going to be the whole thing. It's going to be spots. There are some hot spots that are in trouble, big trouble. And uh, there are other areas that are in no trouble at all. They watch it on television. They don't know. You know, it's just not affecting them. And that's — they're lucky. They're lucky. But there are areas of the country that don't have much of a problem and some that don't have any problem. Uh, they're not going to have a problem with hospitals. But some areas like New York, California, state of Washington, they're going to have some difficulty. And when we see that coming, we're going to be in there. We're already making preparation for it. Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, your trade advisor, Peter Navarro, have been recommending an executive order that would uh, ensure that the, the raw materials for pharmaceuticals and medical devices are manufactured here in the United States. Um, we were getting some indications last week that you were close to signing this executive order. Can you tell us? Well, we're looking at different that? things, John. I don't want to say exactly. Right now, China's been uh, sending us everything we need. Uh, but we're, we're looking at some alternatives, yes. We are looking for alternatives. Sure, and we have other places. Ireland does a lot of work for us. You know that in that world, in the pharma world. Uh, a very tremendous producer. Uh, and we are looking to bring uh, a lot more back home. And I've been, excuse me, you know me for a long time. I've been talking about this for many years, long before I decided to run for president. I've been talking about this. And uh, we have to be able to take care of our country. And uh, that was one of the many things on the list. So we'll be talking about it. But we are, we are discussing it. And Marco is very much involved. And uh, Peter is very much involved. A lot of people are involved, and a lot of people feel that way. But we'll be discussing. Let's go, please. Thank you, sir. Um, you said, uh, Canada has closed its uh, borders to non-citizens. Uh, are you considering not to the United States? Not to the United States, of course. Are you considering closing the land borders in the United States? And also, you've discussed. Well, Canada has not closed it to the United States, right. so we're working very closely with Canada. And. But they have not closed it. They have closed it to the world, but they have not closed it to the United States. Are you considering closing the U.S. land border? I don't want to say that, but we are discussing things with uh, Canada, and we're discussing things with Mexico, quite honestly. And uh, again, the relationship is outstanding with both. Outstanding. We just signed our deal, USMCA, and the relationship is very strong. Go ahead, please. China and others have criticized you for using the phrase uh, Chinese virus. Uh, how do you feel about that? Are you going to continue using that phrase? Well, China uh, was putting out information, which was false, that our military gave this to them. That was false. And uh, rather than having an argument, I said, uh, I have to call it where it came from. It did come from China. So I think it's a very accurate term. But no, I didn't appreciate the fact that China was saying that our military gave it to them. Our military did not give, give it to anybody. But could critics say using that phrase creates a stigma? Um, no, I don't think so. No, I think saying that our military gave it to them creates a stigma. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, Please. Uh, when you speak to travel and tourism executives today, what specific help are you going to offer to them, if at all, or is it still vague? Well, we're going to help. They need help. Look, let's face it. You know, they go from having record-breaking years. This is the third year of record-breaking years, travel and tourism, airlines, everything. Uh, they were doing record numbers, ordering new planes, building new hotels. Everything was really uh, hunky-dory. And then one day, we hear about this rumor in China, and then we find out it's much more than a rumor. And then, all of a sudden, uh, we make a great decision to close it up early. It would be a whole different world. It would be a whole different world. But we make a decision to close it up to China, and all of a sudden, tourism and and then we close it up to Europe, which, you know, people never heard of this before. I'm not sure that that's ever been done. I know that when I made the decision to close it to China, people told me that's never been done before. But it was a great decision. Uh, we make good decisions. So uh, I'll tell you my best decision. The people behind me are total pros. All over the world, they're respected. Dr. Burks, Anthony, who's become a — where is Anthony? He's become a major television star for — for all the right reasons. No, he's just so professional, so good. The people that we have working here uh, have been 
incredible. And they're totally respected. The Admiral has been incredible having to do with the testing. Incredible. And he's, he's viewing this as testing also for the future. We're building a platform. When we took over this platform, first thing the Admiral said was, this was not designed for what we're talking about, millions of people. It wasn't. And it's nobody's fault. It's not like, who could have ever predicted a thing like this? But we broke it down, and it's really going to be an incredible system. And it is now a great system. Uh, I just, I just want to say, these are incredible people standing behind me. They're the most respected in the world. Every country that you've mentioned today so far has called them, and they call them all the time for advice. There's nobody better than what we have. Mr. Why haven't we seen Dr. Redfield the last couple of days? I don't know. I, I can't he's imagine. In Atlanta. Running the CDC, I can tell you so. he's doing a good job. We're very happy with him. Yeah, please, you have it. Go ahead. Mr. President, yesterday we were being told that the payroll tax was going to comprise the lion's share of fiscal stimulus. Right. We also had the markets fall uh, quite dramatically yesterday. And were you, did that in, inform It wasn't your, about the payroll tax. Did that inform your decision? What in, what? And what made you uh, make that change, and when did you make that change? Well, I didn't make a change. We're looking at payroll tax, and we're looking at various other forms of getting money to people. And uh, the payroll tax is something that I've always liked. The problem is it does take a period of time, you know, months, before they really see something. And we don't really have months in terms of people living. You know, a lot of these you have, uh, you have people that work on tips. You have people in our — it's a large number of people. It's a tremendous — who would think this, right? But — and they do nicely. They work very hard, but they work on tips. We have to take care of our people. We don't want to have people suffering during this period. It wasn't their fault that uh, this thing all of a sudden was upon us. So we're looking at various — we're also looking at payroll tax. You know, it's possible. It's also possible we'll do a percentage of payroll tax and then other things. But we'd like to be able to get money to people uh, — you know, we're very lucky. Our country's doing so well. We can do this, and we can do it easily, but we have to do it. And, and I have to say, Mitch McConnell, uh, if you look at Mitch and Kevin and the whole group, and it's been, it's been incredible how they're reacting, how Congress is reacting, how — whether it's the House or Senate, how they're, they're moving. And I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans, but we've had uh, tremendous leadership meetings. And they want to see it done right. And they do want to go big. I think going big is important. I don't think we want to go up there every day with a different idea, a different concept. Oh, gee, let's worry about the airlines. Let's do this one. You have a big problem with the cruise ship industry. It's an industry that was setting all sorts of records two months ago. Then all of a sudden, uh, there's nobody on the ships, okay? So we have to help these. These are great industries. These are going to be taking care of people and passengers and, and for years to come and paying tremendous taxes. Tremendous taxes for years to come. So we have to make sure that this is uh, done. Yes, John? Uh, so, Mr. President, I want to bring up what, what you referred to just a short while ago about